Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the Extraordinary Technology Conference 2017. It is my pleasure to introduce you to a personal friend of mine and a conference favorite. He has lectured here on everything from radiant energy and the collective works of T. Henry Moray to, um, to harnessing Harness, proper use and harnessing of hydrogen energy to actually uh, even going beyond that to the use of uh, water clusters and plasmoids and ether energy stored in water. He's a, the author of three books, Quest for Zero Point Energy, The Energy Machine of T. Henry Moray, which I was actually able to see some parts of and it was pretty profound, and Tapping Zero Point Energy. When I first got into the uh, into the weird science field, I lectured at, uh, at this conference approximately 14 years ago. And Moray King actually came up and he gave me these three books. And they have, uh, they have actually shaped, helped shape my life and shape my understanding of uh, ether energy ever since then. So I would love for you to give a warm welcome to Moray King. Oh, thank you very much. I so appreciate being at this conference. And, and my favorite part of it is actually the interaction with all of you. Uh, I learned so much in the inter uh, as we interact and brainstorm. Now, is that true about you too? Yeah, I think we should give, yeah, yes. <laughs> applause. I'll, I'll tell you a story, what I, what I just learned yesterday. Um, I was just walking the halls, and I just saw, I saw something incredible. There was these large gray boxes with these talking heads on top. Do you guys see that? It's incredible. And they telepathically communicated to me, and they directed me down the hall to uh, Jerry Riviera's beautiful tube, his priority to plasma tube, and I love plasma tubes. Right next to it was a cockpit chair, and I sat on it, and he says, I'll give you a trial run. And he says, what do you want, uh, the relaxation mode or uh, mind expansion? I said, no question there, baby, mind expansion. He says, well, that's kind of still experimental, and, and uh, we haven't really tried it out at, uh, at all the settings. And I says, I want you to ramp it up to max. Bring it on, baby, ramp it up to max. He says, well, well what happened? It got me on, it started vibrating. And he says, normally the field is six feet. Well, this one went out to 16 feet, and people started backing away. You know, and um, so what happened to me, I could see field expansion. Everything was expanding. I felt like I was a giant head hovering on top of the uh, ceiling. And I, I understood the fourth dimensional well enough that, that the illusion of getting bigger is really motion in the fourth dimension. And I got to the other side, and this big ball of light approached me. Boom! It hit me with a quantum dump of information. Quantum dump. And uh, I quickly came back and they said I was only out seconds. It seemed like minutes. I can't share everything that was projected into me because mankind is not yet ready. However, it did answer one question. I had, um, I've been meditating on the Zen cone and, and the cone was, why did the, why did the Tesla techie cross the road? Did you ever meditate on that? I mean, you should. So, uh, and the answer occurred to me, the answer came to me. And the answer was because its scalar wave, morphogenic, auric field was quantum entangled with a chicken. <laughs> uh, see, that's what I love about Tesla Tech. You, you understand the answer. That's beautiful. Well, here at Tesla Tech, we're so much aware and a uh, big advantage we have more information than the general public out there and we we are we are truly blessed because we really know that we are being mind controlled by chickens so so this so this talk is an overview of um, a number of my best picks on energy machines that I talked on over the years, these were my top picks, and I, by reviewing I had a common thread to explain them all. And that's what I'm, I'm going to do, and, and they all are associated with harvesting uh, plasmoid energy. So a variety of devices can be explained by one explanation. So what is in common between dust particles, cloud particles? And inert gas clusters, inert gases can cluster. Not a whole lot until you 
subjected to an abrupt electrical discharge, then something in common happens to them all. They convert into microscopic ball lightning. And what happens is that to make ball lightning, you need a symmetrical particle. And the plasma can melt it, or if it can start out as a, a, a tiny droplet of water or a fog particle, it, the plasma makes a pinch into a torus and turns into a plasmoid. And a plasmoid is a, basically a vortex ring of plasma. Right? It can be a little more complicated than that, and we go into some of the higher dimensional ideas, but that's the basic idea. The vortex ring, it's like a slinky closing on itself. And, you, and the only way you can make the vortex ring, it has to form all at one time, and that's why it always requires a template of matter of some sort, a liquid, a symmetrical template, like a liquid drop. It can be liquid metal, it can be water. It needs that template to make the ball lightning. It happens all the time at the microscopic level. Uh, Ken Shoulders made a career out of studying this. He was a true empirical science, a humble guy. Not too many people know about him because he didn't really advertise much, but he truly studied these, and he's my hero because I've known him for years. I've personally visited his lab, and he did remarkable basic empirical scientific work. And basically, the discovery he made on the microscopic plasmoids was they had this self-acceleration characteristic. They just take off. And when they do, they can exhibit excess force on anything they strike. And also, they exhibit electromagnetic pulse. If they hit a conductor, it gives off a big electromagnetic pulse. So in the work, we will review, as we review the work of Ken Shoulders, we will actually get insight into some deep mysteries. And we'll explore the mystery of charge creation from the vacuum, pairs, how pairs arise from the vacuum. He, he had a lot of insight to that. And as a bonus, we'll explore the mystery of mankind. The mystery of mankind. Take the word mankind. It is comprised of two words, mank and ein. <laughs> what do they mean? No one knows. That's why it's a mystery. <laughs> I learned this from the astute philosopher Jack Handy. And by studying his work, now that we are philosophically prepared, we can ask the deep question, what is the energy source? Uh, mankind, you'd say the history of science, believed in an ether. Really, from the 1700s through the 1800s up to 1905, when the Michelson and Morley experiment came along, it says, gee, I can't detect a static ether, but it was, it was a very primitive model of the ether where the Earth is supposed to move and you feel the wind as it moves by. Uh, and they said, well, I can't detect anything, so Einstein used that to say the ether doesn't exist. But not so fast, because the experiment was repeated by Dayton Miller with an interferometer 10 times bigger. He worked with Michelson to make the careful experiments. He was a heavyweight. He was the president of the American Physical Society, and he was an experimental physicist. And he was detecting, at ground level, about the same small effect that Michelson and Morley detected with the interferometer. But when he took the interferometer up to Mount Wilson, the top there, he saw some ether drift. And basically, this supported a model of the ether drag theory, where as the Earth moves through it, some of, the, some of it hugs it and drag, gets dragged along with it, just like would normally happen in fluid dynamics. Right? So Einstein did not like this guy because he kept defending and, and refining his experiments, and he finally got to ignore him after he died. But shortly after the acceptance of relativity, Qua uh, there was mysteries in, in, in classical physics, like why is an atom stable? They couldn't explain that. The electrons are supposed to just radiate away. They couldn't explain black, black body radiation. And so that ushered in the era of quantum mechanics. And in quantum mechanics, right at the foundation is the uncertainty principle. There's fluctuations. And what Dirac discovered, those fluctuations were inherited to the fabric of space itself. It makes uh, pair, virtual pairs of electron positrons that pop out of it. And thus, uh, here's a model of a single vacuum fluctuation. It's very tiny. It's down at the Planck length, 10 to the minus 33rd centimeters, 20 orders of magnitude below the size of electron. And it's very fast. 
and the, these are constantly ongoing. If you have a single vacuum fluctuation, you either have to say, if, it, if you ask the question, where does it come from, and you say it comes from nowhere, then you're violating conservation of energy. Or you can say, try to explain where it comes from. And then, so if you want to do physics and you want to conserve energy, then you must start to extend your model of, of, of reality of what's going on. Here's the frequency of it to, to make all the equations self-consistent. The frequency, the, high, the faster the fluctuation, the more the energy density. Shown in that graph. And so what happens at high energy density, space pinches off and produces what Wheeler called wormholes. Wheeler answered the question, he called it the already unified field theory. He says uh, space naturally pinches off and we have flux entering and leaving all the time and they mimic uh, many charges, way smaller than the normal charges, as turbulence, he called the quantum foam. This was a virtual plasma model, the ether, so much more powerful than the original hydrodynamic models because you could get polarization events, you could get all the events that you see in turbulent plasmas, and that analogy carries forward. So when I read about Wheeler's work, I was enthralled because the ether came back about 1930 in the form of this. So imagine this, all of history from the timeline of mankind, we have a, we have a hydrodynamic ether, 1905, the scientific community throws away the ether saying, oh, displaying re special relativity has to be gone. 1930, 25 years later, it comes back in a better form in this quantum foam, and that's the way it's been ever since. But guess what dominates the thinking of the energy community? That small 25-year gap in history. Engineers believe the empty space is empty because they were never taught in school that these possibilities are out of physics. And Wheeler's theory, it comes through uh, as a higher dimensional fl a flux from a higher dimensional space. So that flatland slot represents our 3D space like the plane of the table, and the zero point flux comes at right angles to it. And as it, on the left, as it comes through incoherently, that's the background, zero point energy fluctuations. If there's a slight tilt to it as it comes through, a little bit's aligned in our three-dimensional space, and they call that a polarized vacuum. And in this model, if there's vorticity as a zero-point energy flux comes through, that is the elementary particles. So in this model, the elementary particles like the whirlpool, and it must be maintained by the flow of the stream. And so every particle is maintained by the flow of the zero-point energy flux. How do we get to the energy? We work with highly nonlinear systems like plasma. We abruptly drive them far from equilibrium, and that's where the abrupt discharge is important. And then we maximize the zero point energy interaction by using the correct types of particles, ions, nuclei of, of the atoms. And if you make vortex form of those nuclei, you'll get big, big effects. Normally, the conduction cloud in wires, electrons are like a smeared charge cloud. And so they're essentially in thermodynamic equilibrium with the zero point energy. And thus, you don't really see any big energy effects or free energy effects with just simple conduction in our normal circuits. However, the vacuum polarization of the nucleus has steep lines converging of vacuum polarization onto the nucleus. And thus, any type of abrupt motion in the nucleus activates the vacuum in a coherent fashion. And they see it in the, in the collision experiments. They call them in coherent vacuum states. They see it in the plasmas, especially when in the ion acoustic mode of the plasma where the ions are oscillating back and forth. And what that does is cause what in engineers will call the displacement current in the vacuum. Displacement current essentially means a polarization. And so that's what the engineering community calls it. And what do they see in the plasma, the ion acoustic mode? They'll see high frequency spikes, runaway electrons, excessive heat. Typically, the excess energy manifests as high voltage spikes, high vo higher voltage than you would normally get from the energy you're putting in. Essentially, when you ever you abruptly move an ion or jerk it or surge it, you can see how it bends a little bit of that flux into our space. And so it gets how this, we get to the energy, get to the zero point energies from abrupt ion motion. 
Uh, there could be a wake behind it, just like a wake behind a jet. That's why, you know, vortex type activity. So there's some structure, like, like a zero point energy flux vortex ring. This type of structure is being speculated for, for what could be a model for displacement current. And we'll see this come up again when, when we uh, address the idea of cold current. We'll see this type, there could be structure caused in the vacuum caused by the jerking ions. Ball lightning itself orthorotates this flux and traps it into the ball lightning particle. Orthorotate means to bend at right angles. And then the, it typically exhibits the abrupt acceleration when that happens. So to make free energy, just make a lot of plasmoids, especially the microscopic kind. Ken Shoulders. Was, was the man who really, really delivered information on what's going on. He, at first, made them quite easy. They were uh, just a sharp, pointed uh, electrode, abruptly discharges a capacitor, and has to be a very abrupt to launch it, and off the tip would come this little plasmoid event. At first, they thought it was a collection of charges, and so they saw this is charge clusters, is what they first called them. And if it will follow, it will run along a dielectric, and then eventually hit a conductor and, and, and put a crater in it whenever it hits. And that was the clue that he had too much energy because he didn't have that much energy on the capacitor. He called them electron validum, or EV. That's Latin for strong charge. They, were, they exhibited about the charge of 100 billion electrons. They seemed to drag along about a million ions. They always exhibited the charge to mass ratio like the electron. That keeps coming up in Ken Shoulder's studies. And they contain excessive energy. And when he was convinced from his measurements that indeed they contain more, well more energy than he had on the original capacitor, he renamed them to exotic vacuum objects, or EVO. Mace Yachts was the president of the National Academy of, of Science in the in Soviet Union. In the 90s, he liked this topic, and he uh, knew about shoulders, and he was explaining uh, what was going on on that sharp pointed electrode. So imagine that electrode is a blow up of a very sharp point, and a liquid, little bit of liquid metal it melts, and, it, and a protuberance starts to, to extend out into the glow plasma around it, and then the tip of that liquid metal blows off, and you have perfect liquid metal droplet. For the, for the field to create a vortex ring around it as it, hits, as it hits the plasma. And that's how they were made. Of course, you erode the tip. And so what Ken Shoulders did is he, did, he replenished the tip with liquid metal itself. I can't remember the name of the liquid metal. It wasn't mercury. He knew that was dangerous. But he, kept, he replenishes the tip so he doesn't wear it off. They're very clever. It's like a fountain pen. Uh, there's been a number of analysis of how this thing could hold together if, if it was charged. And this, and this was a classical analysis made by uh, my friend Hal Fox, he's passed away, and, and Dr. Jin. And they did a classical field analysis. And they said, in the classical calculation, oh my gosh, the way the fields are, squeezes down, we have energy densities exceeding a neutron star inside that ring. But because it was a classical analysis, they knew that at energy densities like that, quantum mechanical effects take, take over. And sure enough, there in the physical re review, there was an analysis on how, uh, how it could be stable, uh, taking advantage of the displacement current in, in, in the fabric of space to uh, explain the stability of that. Notice that, that quick switching time, that's quick time that they have to come into existence, that's uh, femtoseconds. You'll hear a little bit about that when, uh, from Bob Boyce at 4 o'clock. He detected the black EVs. They would just go dormant, and you couldn't see them, and then a small electric pulse could reactivate them to display light. So these could be occurring. Um, maybe they're under your bed. <laughs> How they could also kind of group up. And they would form necklaces or, or chains. This was very important. He could make positive ones. And they had the charge to mass ratio just like the positrons.
but they were not comprised of positrons because when they hit a conductor and dissipated, he got none of the gamma radiation of electron-positron annihilation. So this, I told him, this is the most fundamental experiment to say what's going on. Why is the charge to mass ratio always like the electron or the positron regardless of how big the thing is? It was, uh, this was a fundamental thing that the way the vacuum likes to yield charge. How he would make pairs. And you can see the, the dual craters and they, they would spiral around each other. Uh, Bostic also observed them with the big plasmoids in his plasma experiments back in the late 50s. Same type of thing. Two counter-rotating vortex rings. Uh, it's mentioned in the, in the occult literature that, that essentially was channeled in uh, cult chemistry by Ledbetter. Uh, has a similar model. They called it the Anu. And what Ken Shoulders loved was the propulsion. He was a, he was a real propulsion guy, kind of like uh, Russ Anderson. And so these things would go up to the, nearly the speed of light, well, or one-tenth the speed of light. They would carry debris along with them. And no matter what they dragged along, it still exhibited the mass, charge and mass ratio of the electron. And he knew he was on to some type of a propulsion drive, like a warp, warp drive. And other physicists jumped on board with him and says, yeah, you may have something there that you're kind of measuring in a microscopic experiment, uh, a propulsion, like a flying saucer propulsion. A big electromagnetic pulse whenever it hit a conductor. And so one of the questions was, is there a way to harvest that pulse? Because we get, get our energy out as electricity, and we'll certainly look at how it's being done. He can make extremely fast switching by, by shooting EV at a small wire stub, and he, he would call that the pico pulsar because it would, he could create a very, very abrupt switching event with the plasma discharge this way. And he then learned, well, I can cascade. I could do one, one EV uh, hitting another one in a cascade, like, like the pico pulsar. And what happened, it would get bigger. He would coherently make a bigger EV. In fact, if he made a big cascade line, he could get them up to a centimeter in size. But he hated those things, because as soon as that big EV struck any conductor, it would put out such a huge EMP that his lab equipment, even the stuff that wasn't plugged in, would fry the electronics from, from the big EMP. So he could not afford to keep creating those because he was losing his lab equipment. So he just stuck with studying the small ones. Here's his claim for the biggest energy anomaly that he ever ma made. And, he, and what he does is he takes an EV, small capacitor discharge, shoots them through a little water vortex through one of the bore, small boreholes. He makes a water vortex. And when he shoots that thing through, the entire vortex seems to be a coherent, coherence in the zero-point energy itself. and makes, makes a, a, a plasma vortex. It was so powerful, no matter what it hit, it would damage it. He could not discover a way to tap it. He said, it's like shooting a bullet at a windmill blade. It was just too, too powerful and too concentrated. So how do we harvest the energy? Uh, one of my favorite experiments is, uh, well, I'll get to my favorite. This, this, is, this is a silly experiment. It's exploding wire experiments. A lot of liquid metal when they explode a wire. Big abrupt pulse in the thin wire. It just blows it up, all this little liquid metal droplets, and you get a lot of EV formation in that plasma, you know, for, for milliseconds. And here's, here's the silly one. They set the record in 2006. They made a huge tungsten array. They hit it with a 20 million amp pulse. And uh, just setting that thing up, <laughs> just blowing it up in one shot. And uh, they noticed they were getting more energy out, more heat energy than, than was on the original capacitor bank to, to blow it up. So they're scratching their heads. And uh, we better stop doing those experiments. And they never repeat it. It's, but they set the record on planet Earth. Where it happens naturally is cracking crystals. Whenever a crystal cracks, there's an anomalous persistence in the crack of, of a little EV, a little plasmoid. And these are the same as the earthquake lights. Well, a fissure on an earthquake, right? The, the ball lightning people observe come out of it. Same phenomena so, so happening microscopically. And Ed Storms uh, just had a great paper, review paper. He's Big cold fusion proponent, great engineer, great analysis. 
And he, after reviewing all the literature on cold fusion, he concluded somehow cracking is associated. It has to, there's a cracking event, and that's when the heat anomaly occurs. And I don't think he cited the fractal emission, because he, he couldn't, he's an engineer, didn't know about the zero-point energy, nor did he want to use it in his hypothesis. So he's left with the mystery. It's in the cracking. The best of the best of all the cold fusion class of experiments was done by Patterson. He even got a patent on it because he didn't call it cold fusion. He was, an he was an expert electroplating, and what he would do was he would make these electroplated beads, and he would load them uh, with light water, not heavy water. It wasn't a deuterium fusion. He could separate good beads from bad, and he always could make the heat anomaly every single time. This was the mid-90s. I called that the, that was the peak of the cold fusion experiments, in my opinion, because it was repeatable. Every single time it can make the heat anomaly. So here's a diagram of his beads, right? He alternates layers of palladium and nickel. And, and then, then you load it in electrolysis system, and you got to load these things to supersaturation, which is quite, kind of hard to do, but he just did that with the ordinary water. And guess what happened? The beads cracked, right? Oh, I said, oh my gosh, I don't have longevity here, it's going to flake. But the cracking was the point. In the crack was the fractal emission plasmoid. And that's why I made the heat all the time. So Ken Shoulders is credited with that hypothesis to explain cold fusion. He, he, he proposed it very early and, and, and basically was ignored by everybody. But that's my favorite example of su repeatable, successful cold fusion. And by the way, Patterson also measured there were transmutation events from, from the, this, these cracking events, which, which matches uh, some of the things observed by these plasmoids. Another way to harvest it is by force. Take advantage of self-acceleration. Uh, Professor Trowbridge, back in Harvard in 1907, just noticed that whenever I spray some water mist into an electric arc, the sound is a lot bigger, right? There was more power, but it, he, didn't, he didn't know why, right? He just left it at that. It was just an observation. But Peter Grenu at MIT made a career out of studying explosive uh, uh, discharge in water. And this, uh, he, was, he was in Phys Letters in 1985, so he's at MIT studying this, and he says, if I make a very abrupt discharge, in the water. I can throw the weight up in the air on top of the water, measure how high it goes. And he, he even had some high-speed photography capturing, capturing some ball lightning events in the chamber itself. And um, he did measure excess force, but sometimes he blew out the bolts, right? So he never really made the measurement of all the f energy and all the force that he had. So Gary Johnson, an electrical engineering professor at Kansas State University, re redesigned the same experiment, and he made his chamber spherical weights meant to blow apart and fly up guide wires. So that way he could measure, record how high they got flown in the air, how much energy is on the capacitor, and he proved repeatedly that he had excess energy, over unity energy in this experiment, as well as excess force, anomalous force. Uh, it was published in the proceedings of one of the energy conferences and ignored. You know, the scientific community just ignored it. And there he is, the repeating experiment. Any university can do it. Uh, detailed studies of Grenou's team with the high-speed photography that would make studies of the explosive event associated the anomalies with the fog particles. And as we'll see, the fog particles are indeed the key. Uh, you can make fog particles with piezoelectrics. And so there was discussions on the web. Why not use that to drive a combustion engine? Use uh, your normal tr ultrasonic transducers to make fog, direct it in the internal combustion engine, and hit it with a big plasma pulse and see what we get. And darn, if that's not what Walt, Walter Jenkins did. I, I, I learned of him last year. He was my hero because he put everything together. He did not know about anybody else in the field working on this. He was a lone inventor. And all by himself, he came up with the definitive experiment because he did not use electrolysis. He patented uh, what he did, and that patent is a sufficient disclosure to, to show 
what indeed he did, so he has patent coverage. And he made fog with the ultrasonic transducers. Why, why, why 1.6 megahertz? Because that's, you can get those cheap ones out of China. That's what makes the decoration for ponds, right? They, they, uh, because that makes the most visible fog. So that's why, that was why it was chosen. Uh, he used some electrostatic grids to charge the fog up, and thus he could guide it up into the internal combustion chamber. Very clever to use electrostatic grids to guide it. He invented a wide plasma spark plug. And he said that well, he was inspired by Nikola, Nikola Tesla, the Tesla coil with the big sphere on top. That was the inspiration of making it. And he would fire that spark plug at a huge voltage, way higher than the norm. He didn't want to make a little spark. He wanted to make a huge plasma, wide plasma. So he's firing it up around 100, 100 to 200 kilovolts, and he keeps firing it for the full downstroke of the piston. Keeps firing that thing. He really got control of his electronics. He was good uh, with electronics, completely controlling the timing. Made little scooters. Uh, put out a video uh, that made a genset that could self-run from this phenomena. Uh, of course, Stan Meyer's famous. Uh, we all know about Stan Myers and the Doom Buggy. And he's doing something similar on his last invention, the water injector plug. So he, he wasn't doing electrolysis anymore. He was just trying to get some little water mist in. Here's the Canadian patent, where he mixed some ionized air and some water and a big discharge, and that was going to drive the piston. This was the device that he was going to try to mass produce. And uh, he's likely he was murdered over this device. Oh, Joseph Papp has the best experiment scientifically for a big anomaly because he works with inert gases. There is absolutely no combustion at all on that. Inert gases do one, one thing very interesting. When you bring them up to a plasma, let it cool down, bring it up to a plasma, let it cool down, they form into clusters. Papp was doing this back in the 60s. Our science never even discovered inert gases could cluster like that until the 80s. So I'm convinced Pap was channeling or something from beyond to get him to do what he did because there's no, no reason to just a priori just do that. So he was definitely inspired because he was doing things beyond our science. Here's a side view of the piston. Um, used a little bit of radioactive material to help create this, the, the, the plasma vent to, to make the ball lightning out of the inert gas clusters. And notice when the piston is all, all the way closed on the right. There's a vortex ring flow. It's like a giant, it's shaped to intentionally make a giant vortex ring. So he's making um, the, the plasmoid vortex ring uh, um, like a coherent, a large co coherence in that. So for him to do all this well outside of our science tells me that he was in, t in touch with somebody, the top side or whatever. We like to harvest things by electricity. That's what we do at the Tesla conference. It's all about grabbing electricity. So can we grab that EMP? Uh, it turns out, John, you can play this. It turns out every single discharge always has a ball lightning precursor on it. And we didn't learn this until we had um, high-speed photography. And this is a, a high-speed photography of, of lightning. Well, can you push play? Can you push play? Who can work the mouse? Anyone? Anyone? Push play. You just take that little mouse and push play. It'll work. We tested it. Uh, they're, they're instructed to keep your hands off the equipment. Just, just push play. Uh, the mouse came so close. OK, I'm, I can't. I, uh, Oh, I can't, I can't, I gotta move on. You can't push play, you're forbidden? All right. He's, a, he's an electrical engineering professor. He knows how. <laughs> okay, we, we did it. Okay, John uh, let me down. He said it all worked, he tested it. He did not, obviously. Okay, we're moving on. Let's see, okay. 
So in every spike, in every high voltage spike discharge, uh, that phrase came up, it's the spike. And guess who came up with it? Uh, John Bedini did his career, just passed away, so I wanted to honor him. He did a lot of experiments with spiking discharge events, typically onto, onto batteries, and he was very open and, and shared quite a bit with the community. He just passed away last year. I got to meet him in 1984 at the first Tesla conference, and I was honored to go up to their conference and meet him again uh, last year. So, and so it was Tesla. He credits Tesla with the first observation. These are very abrupt switching events. And what Tesla called it was radiant energy. It's an unfortunate term because it's, these days it's too general. But what Tesla meant was something's happening on an abrupt switching event. Uh, it's typically abrupt DC with some type of plasma circuit breaker. And you would have this pulse that goes out. And you could feel this tingling. And he wanted to study that. He thought that was where the real energy anomalies were. And, and so basically it's a high voltage pulse from an abrupt switching event. And in that plasma, you would jerk whatever ions were in that spark discharge, and that's where you could get your vacuum polarization that would from, and cohere the vacuum energy from that event. And basically the, the pulse would travel uh, near the speed of light before the electrons had a chance to move from the sparking event. And the idea was to harvest that precursor a precursor event, and, and, don't, and, and quench the circuit before conduction occurs. So you're just harvesting that displacement current event. Uh, that could explain maybe cold current. There's some st we know that the field energy is stored around the conductor, so the conductor acts like a waveguide for this, this event, this coherent event. Maybe it's a, plasma, a vacuum polarization, vortex ring. We don't know. We're just on the edge of even discovering that it's really, really there. Um, Bedini named this simple circuit from a capacitor back to, back to the voltage. He, he named it as the Tesla switch to honor Tesla. So that was one of the simpler devices. He liked to use uh, the induction coil uh, collapse to get spikes. And so it was a variety of devices that he would invent and he would share with people. Uh, very interesting when you pulse batteries. Right? You look at the plate. On a new battery, it has a fine mesh, sharp edges like that, and that creates a huge E field, and then you could pulse, that E field would jerk the ions in the electrolyte itself. So the, the battery itself could be a contributor to, to this excess energy event. Uh, he liked to use fresh batteries. He said if you sulfate them all up and everything else, you lose that fine mesh and you lose your, your sharp, sharpness of, of the electrode itself to make the high fields. Uh, the school girl circuit is famous because he helped the high school girl with her science project. And his goal was to make the simplest energy machine that produces an effect in one web page, right, to communicate to the world in one web page on the simple circuit of, of this class of experiments. And there it is up on the web. By the way, uh, you'll be able to download these slides. I'll tell you how at the end. Well, that's just making a little pulse on the switching events, but what if we build up a lot of glow plasma first before we do the, the event? Now we have a lot of plasma to work with. That's actually done in, for switching in high power applications. Uh, so you have the hollow cathode, and they call them pseudosparks, and this is studied by the standard engineering community as a technique to do high voltage switching. The plasma focus device by Eric Lerner uh, he was trying for fusion with this device, and, and, and these devices always produce plasmoids. And he was seeing excess energy, but because he uh, was an engineer, I interacted with him at one of the energy conference. He didn't want any zero-point energy in his, in his world, right? I'm just doing fusion. So he was trying for a clean type of fusion. And one thing I really liked was he output it as electricity. And the way he did that, when he had a plasmoid in that every time, and as it decayed, it would shoot a beam of electrons in one direction, a beam of ions in the other direction, and he was trying to harvest that as electricity. So I think uh, he has one of the best devices, and I couldn't convince him, hey, it's a really a zero-point energy device. Uh, there are others that work with glow discharge tubes. The Koreas did some careful work. Uh, they were big in the 90s. Eugene Malov of Infinite Energy Magazine uh, just loved them. Here, there, here they are on the cover. And they would make the big tubes, the husband and wife team. She was a glass blower. She could actually make the big discharge tubes. And what he did was um, he would build up a lot of glow plasma on the tube, and then he would discharge it, 
and immediately quench it right after the discharge. So you have charging it, build up, and then the discharge. And then quench it. He would observe, here's some photographs of the, of the tubes. They would get some vortex action as, as the discharge occurred. And he said he measured negative resistance on the, on the discharge event. And that's how he knew negative resistance means energy is entering the system. And over there, he said, very important to quench the arc right after you fire it. Because the arc's all lossy, it's all electron flows, and you're going to have losses there. So he designed a circuit to do just that. Uh, and he would pulse batteries. And I go, oh, you have to pulse batteries. It's really hard to convince a skeptic if you're, if you're working with batteries on free energy, because, like, oh, that's just the battery. And he's, well, wait a minute, I'm only using one and I'm charging up two. Yeah, it's just the battery. It's, it's hard to convince. That's why I would prefer for clean experiment not to have the batteries involved. Uh, they did a great job. Their website's great and have a lot of information that they, they share. And so they're quietly working up in Canada. Ed Gray had a great tube. He was famous. Won the inventor of the year in 1976, what he called a pulse capacitor discharge engine. There was his first patent in 76. Uh, the only trouble was he wasn't driving that off a capacitor at all. In fact, he had a very, very special circuit. And that circuit would drive a special tube right here. And what's special about the circuit, they would have, they would have three gaps uh, to, to fire it. He said the secret to his tubes is split the positive right down the middle. And those splits were just like that pico pulser of shoulders. Every time you, you have a discharge across it, very abrupt event. So you force uh, the power to go in one direction, the, the plasma that has chances to re relax back. And of course, his most important gap was the one inside the tube. So this was the brilliant invention of uh, Ed Gray, and this is what drives his tubes. See this grid right here? He would build up his glow plasma in the grid. He wrote the same patent twice. And the only difference was the later patent just kept emphasizing more claims regarding the grid and the glow plasma. That was the important part of the invention. So in that grid, there could be two modes of working this plasma. Right? Uh, we, we have high voltage on, on the anode. We haven't switched anything yet. And in one event, he talks about these two events in the, in the patent. Is, it's like pulling apart a rubber band and letting go. You polarize the plasma, right? And then when he fires the switching event, very abrupt, it's like letting the plasma go and letting, letting it snap back. He's capturing that snap back. And that was the preferred mode because notice there's no conduction at all of electrons. It's a pure polarization and a snap back, a pure abrupt event that would, that, that would then be guided on the wires. And, he was, and people were observing cold current from, from the tube. The other event, it could actually discharge in like a normal discharge. That too would likely produce excess energy because it's a big discharge event. And you could see this avalanche occur from the grid it's, itself onto the, onto the anode. So either event would give you excess energy in that pulse. I really enjoy Peter Lindemann's book. I gave him a big kudos because he did a great analysis of the, of the gray tube and the circuits. I highly recommend his book. But I'm, a, I'm going to pure experiment for the skeptics. Do we have to use the battery, right? The skeptics, if the battery's there, they won't believe it. And I said, so my favorite project that did not use the battery, that harvest spikes, was William Hyde. And what he invented was a field chopper, right? Well, electro, you just put electric charge out on the exciters, and you just leave it there, and then you run the rotors like a fan. And... Um, why would that produce free energy? In fact, I was wondering, why did you even make that? Uh, they made this in the old days before they had waveform generators, and depending how you shaped your blades, you can make different waveforms from DC, right? But the, I, I, was, I wanted to call him and ask him, how did he think of doing that? Notice the red arrow on the insulator. I'm going to see this is very important. Uh, here's a side view or top view of, of, of what's happening. When the rotor shields the stator, there's no field, but when the rotor is when the gap of the rotor, you, we could start to charge up the stators. So as you rotate really fast, you'll start to get pulses. And what he said was that nothing much happens under slow rotation. 
But when I got my rotation speeds really high, I start to see corona on the stator. And that was the key. No, no free energy type effects at all until he got that plasma going on the stator itself. And when he said that, that was the key. To do, imagine that charge accumulating on the stator and see that tiny insulator gap was very small. It would, would cause a, a discharge across the insulator gap onto the next stator. So basically, I had these series of discharges going around, and each one of those discharges now produced a spike. It was a plasma discharge. It would make EVs, and now he's going to find a way to harvest these very sharp spike events that were coming off the stator towards his pulse circuit. And I think in his final device, he had approximately 24 stator segments per, per segment. His final device was huge. He had cascaded 10 machines together, all in one rotor. So there's 10 hide machines together. And look at those output power he got, 20 to almost 23 kilowatts. And his input power just to drive the, the motor well, was only two, two and a half kilowatts. So he got 20.5 kilowatts free running. He got the, closed the loop, free ran it, and boy did the suppression hit on him. And this was in the 90s where I was encountering him on the phone. There was somebody traveling to, to his lab in Idaho Falls as they were going back and forth uh, between Seattle and Provo. And uh, he was super paranoid. The last thing he said to me was, I'm hiding out my antenna. Right, I'm getting threatened like crazy, and uh, just try to get it out to the world and, and seek replication. Yeah, but nobody, nobody seemed to be too interested. So this was my favorite device. Um, this circuit, I'll show you a blow up of, of what it is, was criticized by the electrical engineers because what he drew was what he empirically built. Right? He didn't draw, draw correctly for an electrical engineering diagram. As you can see, those lines L1 and L2, they short out the capacitor. So it's incorrectly drawn, uh, but it behaved like this. Right? Imagine there's residual inductance on those lines, L1 and L2. So I picked L because that's the symbol for inductance, electrical engineers. And if there's residual, residual inductance and the capacitors are very physically close to each other, that pulse will naturally take the capacitive path to charge up the capacitors in series because that pulse is choked off from going on down the parallel path. So that was the key to, to making the spike rectifier work. So it acts like a voltage divider. And a voltage divider, you can see we charge up the capacitors in series, and then, whoops, and then we discharge them in parallel. See that? Uh, there's the charge. Do you see it? We charge it up along left to right, the A path in series, and then we discharge in parallel. Is that, is that clear how it works? This is, this is a standard voltage divider in, in, in circuit, in electrical engineering circuits. So he effectively made one of these for spikes. And, he, and the, the chokes blocked the spike from going down the path B. And then the path B would gradually bleed off the energy in parallel. So it was essentially a current multiplier, voltage divider, current multiplier. And that's how we har harvest spikes. What was neat was these were very, very weak electrostatic spikes, right? It's like rubbing your feet on the carpet and then touching. He, just, he would just harvest millions of them. And he could work with very cheap components because any one spike was too weak to damage the components. So he was able to make a lot of them. Uh, to, that's how he made his 10-stage 10, 10 device. Rather remarkable that such weak pulses could be harvested that way. And you can imagine more stages, same principle, more, more stages on it. And thus, what he drew, he empirically drew what he built. And so he kind of draw, drew it wrong, but what he actually built was long wires on the L path, and the residual inductance on the long wires is, is allowed uh, the pulse to go across the series path, and he made sure his capacitors were physically very, very close together. So and, and the, the spike would naturally take the series path and essentially charge up those capacitors by displacement current from the, the sharp pulsing event. So he harvested the spikes. That's his contribution, by the way, to humanity at circuit. Maybe it gives us insight to the Swiss L ML converter because there's this electrostatic type thing going on. They're secretive, that community in Switzerland. Have you all heard of this thing? Yeah, that's uh, 
that they don't want to share the information, but maybe what Clyde did would lend some insight to that. Because what I did is actually very simple. So what is the simplest device? Here's my recommendation. Aaron Murakami, who ran that conference up, up in Coeur d'Alene, really worked with uh, a, a capacitive discharge spark plugs. He wanted to make big capacitive discharges, very abrupt. He's right on the right path with that. Um, they have a patent. He teamed up with, with a team, and they made a patent to, to uh, very abruptly switch with an SCR, the, dump the capacitor in, in the spark gap. And he says when he does experiments, he has to wear the earmuffs and everything else and wear the goggles, because that spark is so huge, it really has a tremendous amount of energy. And uh, there's an example of that. So uh, he's a real leader in the field, and he's sharing his, his information very, very readily. I'd love to see him team up with Walt Jenkins, who invented the Y plasma spark plug, and he invented how to get fog into the combustion chamber, right? And then all he has to do is hit it with that Y plasma spark plug of Aaron, and I think we got ourselves the winning simplest machine. Those two events, they just met this year. They, uh, I, they asked, they have one guy that they fly up as the honored speaker, and I strongly recommend it Walt to him. Last year I was the speaker, this year Walt got the honor, and I really hope they work together, because they deserve it. Walt really deserves it, because he discovered it all by himself, as a lone inventor, so it was rather remarkable. They did that. And they can self-run the gen set. This is a spectacular demonstration, because this is considered impossible if it is combustion. Why? Because the internal combustion engine is so inefficient. Whenever it be, you lose most of your energy, it's heat. Right? You lose 80%. That means if you were to close loop on something like this, whatever anomalous effect you have would have to be 5x over unity, five times that much power, just to account for the losses that are naturally occurring there. And so what's moving that piston is not, is not combustion. See, Walt never put hydrogen in it, right? It's a, it's a pure, it's, a, it's basically P Peter um, Grinot's discovery. Just pulse that plasma. So to wrap up, we see the abrupt discharge jerks the ions in any plasma. So whenever we have any bit of plasma switching anywhere, you jerk those ions, and behind those ions could be a coherence in the vacuum, like a, like a vortex ring weight, or some type of structure in the vacuum that, that holds the displacement current. Ken Shoulders learned how to launch the plasmoids, and they get their excess energy by worth rotation, some of that vacuum energy into the plasmoids, and that causes them to self-accelerate and causes them to have too much energy. We see that we need a template to make the microscopic ball lightning. You have to have some type of liquid droplet of matter so that the plasma can form around it to pinch it in into the torus and into the plasmoid form. We saw three ways to harvest the energy. Heat was my favorite cold fusion type experiment because Patterson did it with light water, not heavy water and it was from the cracking beads. And I think this is really the explanation to the cold fusion phenomena. Thanks to Ed Storm's summary article saying it's associated with the cracking. We see, we see the engines, the famous engines of Papp and Meyer, and now Walt Jenkins with the, with the Y plasma spark plug. This, this uh, creates it by force on these energies. So we got the plas anomalous plasma force, Harvesting the voltage spike. Uh, Bedini was the big leader in, in pulsing batteries. We'll see the continuation of this from Bob Boyce at 4 o'clock, because Bob's taking it to the next level. And we see William Hyde didn't have to use the batteries. He got pure electrostatic pulse just from that simple circuit. He could harvest electrostatic spikes. The Koreas got a big plasma pulse from the discharge tubes, and likewise Gray, working with those plasmas. The cold current effect is the precursor to this event. It's just that the, the switching event itself, the jerking of the ions, no, we don't want, uh, you don't want normal conduction afterwards. So the trick is, is the pulse and quench. And then you could have some type of vacuum polarization being guided by the thin wires. So here's the hope that for the simplest of the devices was teaming up Aaron Marikami with Jenkins, Walt Jenkins, because 
manifesting the self-learning gen set up something so simple that could replicate throughout the hobbyist community. And if others replicate, it transforms the world. Thank you. I got some more slides to show. I, I, got, I got some more slides to show. Don't, don't hook me yet. Oh, he wants to show the video. It's lightning. It's lightning. MPG. See how the ball lightning forms? This, this is 1,700 frames per second. It's a single lightning stroke. Without the high-speed camera, you would never see it. It would just be a flash to the eye. But that, with every discharge has that microscopic ball lightning forming up like that. As soon as one hits the ground, boom, the path is completed, and all the rest just join that conduction path. Every single discharge, even the tiniest one, has this little ball lightning precursor on the tip. Okay, can we go back to the slides? I, okay, I only got three more. These are my ads. Gee, now, now that you couldn't show it, now we can't stop showing it. <laughs> we need the engineering professor. Could you teach him how to use the mouse? Uh, three times now. And you have that repeat, you have the file there three times as well. So uh, just the, I just want the PowerPoint it's just for my last three slides. All right. All right. Uh, there are my books. You can grab them up at the table at the bookstore. And you notice on this book, uh, the inventor's last name uh, is, is identical to my first name. So that was quite a bit of synchronicity for me. And so it was, I was destined to write that book. Um, I like this. The, this was a YouTube interview I have with Gary Hendershot. Uh, on, and if you Google those two words, Paradigm Mora, you can get to this. This answers the question. We really had a long discussion on this YouTube. What's stopping us? What stops? What is stopping humanity from just making this discovery? So just shout it out. What do you think? Vested interest, uh, the government, fear, greed, job security relates. Uh, uh, what, number one is belief. The, I, I'm trying to recruit the engineers. I'm an engineer myself. And they won't, their beliefs block them from even listening to the possibility. And, and that's pretty much the way it is across the community whenever, whenever the ideas are presented. Uh, I would say 99% just go, I can't believe it, and just ignore everything. And if you don't believe, guess what? You're not going to try. Right? So that, to me, that, that was number one, and that's what was discussed. Hey, Mori? Hey, Mor uh-huh. Hey, actually, uh, actually no, nothing's stopping us. There are a few people that are making those. Their paradigm isn't in the box. They're not the trained fleet. Look at Ken. Yeah, uh, it doesn't take, it, how, many to, how many minds does it take to change the world? One, you got your, that's, that's what I love about Tesla Tech. You got all the right answers, right? Just one. But you have to be willing to share because you need an army because there is suppression. By the way, uh, you can, uh, this, this whole slide deck will be up uh, at that location. And if you Google Rex Research King, you can get uh, any, any of my slide decks from my previous presentation. So it's your turn now. Let's have some questions. Okay. okay. Excuse me. Anybody have any questions? Come on up. Come on down. Sanu, this question is right for you. Or, or answers. You can come give answers. Um, actually, I have one for you, Maury. Are you familiar with the, uh, um, the lightning test lab that was at uh, La Salle? They uh, decommissioned it a couple of years back and sold off most of the parts. Were you familiar with that lab? I don't think so. I, I can't hear you. Hold on, hold on. Did, uh, okay, go ahead. What was your answer? I, I don't know. I'm not familiar with them. There was a gentleman just up the freeway, the 25, that bought out all 
of the assets of that laboratory. You know, and uh, he had some capacitors and some spark gaps and some coils that were just unbelievable to die for. And Ken would have would have enjoyed playing in this guy's backyard. <laughs> maybe he's there. Hey, who knows? Can't yeah, keep maybe, a good spirit down. Maybe he's there now. Okay, any other questions for uh, Maury King? Ladies and gentlemen, Maury King, thank you. Thank you.